Good morning, everyone. Today is Wednesday, June 21st, 2023. I'm Dr. Yamonja Smalls, Director of Professional Development for the Maryland Department of Health's Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to today's self-directed services webinar entitled Individual and Family Directed Goods and Services. On the panel today, we have Christy Colbert, Statewide Coordinator of Self-Directed Services, and Nick Burton, our Director of Programs. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options to hear the webinar, by computer and phone. If you look at the panel interface to your right, labeled audio, you can click either computer or phone to switch for the best option. We will be recording the webinar and posting this session on the YouTube uh, channel and DDA website. Today's PowerPoint has also been uploaded as an attachment and is available for you to download in the webinar panel box. Questions can be typed in the question or chat box in the webinar panel, and the team will review and respond as appropriate. And now I'd like to introduce Christy to begin today's meeting. Good morning, Christy. Good morning, everybody. We can go to the next slide. Uh, good morning. Uh, just thank you so much for attending our webinar today uh, regarding individual and family directed goods and services, or what I will be calling today IFDGS. Uh, Dr. Smalls, we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm really excited to share some updates to our individual and family directed goods and services that we have with our waiver renewal. Uh, today, we'll go through a quick review of IFDGS, and next we'll spend some time talking about the three types of goods and services, recruitment and advertising, day-to-day -day administration, and other goods and services. Can we go to slide three? Oh. There we go. So there's our agenda for today. We can go to the next slide. Let's go through a quick overview of individual and family directed goods and services. I think our, I can't hear you. There we go. Okay, great, here we are. So what are individual and family directed goods and services? IFDGS are services, equipment, activities, or supplies that support people who self-direct their DDA services. They help a person meet listed needs in their PCP. They help maintain or increase independence. And they cannot be provided through a waiver service or other state plan. So there are other services that can't be provided in those ways. Next slide. Dr. Smalls, this is Nick. Maybe we should take it down and put it back up again to see if it if it moves through the slides a little bit better that, that way. Maybe reload the presentation. I can also share my screen if that would be easier. Yeah, <clears throat> Christy, maybe see if you can share your screen and then. Uh... Stay, let's do that. I'm not sure we're having a little bit of a delay. Hold on. 
I'm going to show this one. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you all everyone for your patience. We'll go through eligibility for individual and family directed goods and services. Uh, in order to be il eligible for IFDGS, you must be self-directing your services. Um, the request must help a, a need that is listed in your PCP and they must meet all waiver and program requirements. As I mentioned, there are three categories of IFDGS. The first is recruitment and advertising. Uh, this funding is actually dedicated in the PCP's detailed service authorization instead of cost savings from the budget. And then we have day-to-day -day administrator, which is new to our waiver this year. Um, it is hiring a vendor or employee to support someone uh, which comes from cost savings, and then there are other allowable goods and services from cost savings. Now, let's review recruitment and advertising. Recruitment and advertising help fund activities that support staff and employee recruitment. Uh, they can be, it can be up to $500 each year that is dedicated in the PCP process. Recruitment and advertising can be used to make printed or electronic flyers for sharing job advertisements, for software to create those flyers, such as Adobe, Canva, or Vista. Um, the recruitment or advertising funds can be used to print physical flyers and for any staff registries, such as Indeed or Care.com. You can request these services uh, in your PCP process, either through the annual or revised process. Um, so it, you would request up to $500 in your detailed service authorization. So if you have questions about how to request this, reach out to your coordinator of community service, and you can include that in your annual PCP, or you can revise your PCP to include it. Now, Let's review day-to-day -day administration. Day-to-day -day administration is always paid with cost savings. Cost savings is the funding that is available in the self-directed budget after a person's identified needs are met. Cost savings includes funds that are not spent in the person's budget over time and any unallocated funds from the budget allocation. Day-to-day -day administration is direct or non-direct support to a person who is self-directing. How to use your day-to-day -day administration. So the direct and non-direct support can be household management and scheduling, employee scheduling, scheduling appointments, including medical appointments, and personal money management. Day-to-day -day administrators are required to meet the same standards as other direct support employees, so they must have a cleared background check. If they are supporting someone under 18, they also need to have a child protective services check. Uh, they must maintain active first aid and CPR certifications, and they should uh, keep any have any other requirements that the person has for their employees. There are some exclusions to the day-to-day -day administrator. Currently, family members cannot be hired as day-to-day -day administrators. We are updating our waiver through an amendment to change this to allow family members to provide this service. But for now, family members cannot be hired. Direct support employees may work as the administrator, but cannot provide any other service at the same time. A person's support broker may not also be their administrator. 
and day-to-day -day administrators may work up to 40 hours per week unless otherwise authorized by the DDA. So how do you request a day-to-day -day administrator? After the person's identified needs are met in the PCP, leftover funding or cost savings may be, may be used to pay for a day-to-day -day administrator. So you can include your day-to-day -day administrator in the annual PCP process. So when you're planning every year, you would list that as a service that you need and connect it to an outcome in your PCP and include that service in the self-directed budget sheet. The newly updated self-directed budget sheet for May includes line items for day-to-day -day administrator. If you're in the middle of your plan year and want to add day-to-day -day administration, you would do a revised PCP process. Again, you would connect it to an outcome and then you would note that in the PCP revision and include it in an updated budget sheet. Day-to-day -day administrators can be either employees or vendors. For employees, they are paid a wage with taxes taken out. They would complete timesheets through the person's FMCS electronic billing system, and they are paid biweekly on the FMCS payroll calendar. For vendors, they are paid at a rate without taxes being taken out. They would submit invoices to people, uh, su we've suggested either monthly or biweekly. They should be, they would be paid based on the FMCS vendor calendar. And their invoices must include the name of the person who is self-directing, the name of the day-to-day -day administrator, the company name of the day-to-day -day administrator if they work for a company, the dates the service was provided, the amount of time worked each day listed by the quarter hour, and the amount charged per hour, and the total amount charged for invoice. I'll share an example of an invoice here. So here we see an example where we've listed the administrator as J. Doe, and they're working for E. Graham for the month of July. And so they've listed that they worked a half an hour on July 10th, an hour on July 15th, and an hour and 45 minutes on July 30th, adding up to three hours and 45 minutes or 3.75 hours. They've signed the invoice and they note that they charge $34 an hour. So this invoice is for $127.50. Now we'll review other allowable goods and services. All other goods and services are also paid with cost savings. This is the funding that is available either after the person's needs have been met in the budget or through unallocated funds. They are purchased after all needs in the person-centered plan have been met and accounted for in the budget. So now I'm going to um, read a list of the, what goods and services may be allowed. Activities that promote health, fees for programs, activities that promote socialization and independence, small kitchen appliances for independent meal planning, laundry appliances to promote independence and self-care, sensory and safety items related to disability, personal electronic devices, toothbrushes and dental services not covered by insurance, weight loss program services, nutritional consultation and supplements, internet services, other goods and services that meet the standards. Now I'll read a list of what goods and services do not include. Goods and services cannot be good or service that compromise your health or safety, experimental goods or treatments, co-payments or medical services, over-the-counter medication or homeopathic services, items used solely for entertainment or recreation, monthly cable television fees or services, monthly telephone fees, room and board, food, utility charges, tobacco, alcohol, 
marijuana or illegal drugs, vacation expenses, vehicle insurance, maintenance, or other transportation related expenses, tickets and related costs to attend recreational events, clothing, shoes, or other personal items, haircuts, nail services, and spa treatments, tuition, staff bonuses, subscriptions, training, services in hospitals, cost of travel, meals, and overnight lodging for staff, family, and support, service animals, exercise rooms, swimming pools, and hot tubs, fines, debts, legal fees, and advocacy fees, contributions to savings accounts, including ABLE accounts, country club memberships or dues, and leased and purchased vehicles. We know that the lists are quite long, and we hope to share an individual and family directed goods and services quick guide that will help people and their teams uh, as they plan for what goods and services they can account for in their in their PCPs and in their budgets. Other goods and services should be requested using the new individual and family directed goods and services online request form. This form is going to streamline this new process for all goods and services requests, and we'll be able to also share how everyone is using uh, their goods and services in unique and exciting ways. So I'm really excited about this form. I think it will really help folks, um, it will really help the process be streamlined, but also uh, we'll be able to share really exciting things that are going on. For now, each request must be submitted on this form individually. You'd complete one form for each request. Now let's review how to complete the form. Uh, this form is an online form that first requires the person's name who is self-directing, their date of birth, their regional office, and FMCS agency. This form will automatically be sent to the person who self-directs, their CCS, their FMCS, and the regional office, and any other person that's listed in the form. Any person on the team may submit this request. So we've listed the person, their family member, their coordinator, their support broker, their new day-to-day -day administrator, another employee, their designated, their designated representative, or other. And we've given option for people to list what that other might be and what relationship they have with the team. Uh, as always, we believe that best practice would be for the team to meet together and then complete this form together all uh, while sitting at the table. So for the request, you would list the good or service that you're, be, that you're requesting, you would describe the benefit to the person, and you would list the cost. Any individual purchase of $5,000 or more must be reviewed by the DDI Regional Office. <clears throat> We've also asked some questions regarding budget modifications to support teams to get that process started. So if you've included that good or service in your budget sheet, you will not need to complete a budget modification. So you would check yes in that box and then move on. But if you did not include the request in the budget sheet, that's okay. You would say no and then you would list um, on the request what budget line items you'll be decreasing in order to purchase the good or service. This will help you remember to, for the team to do a budget modification after this request is approved. Then we have a list of attestations that help the team check to make sure the request meets the rules regarding IFDGS. So you check all those boxes. And then by signing, you are agreeing that this request is your choice or the choice of the person you are representing. Then at the bottom, you have uh, an option to include all of the emails that you'd like. So you'd always have to include your CCS 
And if you have a support broker, you'll need to include their support broker email. And then you have an option to include three other emails there too. Reviewing the request form. Your FMCS agency will review any request under $5,000. Um, if the FMCS reviews it, your team will receive an email. Then you'll need to complete any budget, budget modifications that you need. And then you can submit any invoices or receipts for payment to your FMCS. If your FMCS denies the request, the DDA will then receive it and review it within 20 business days. If the DDA approves, the FMCS and team will be notified and you can continue to go through with the purchase. And if the DDA denies it, appeal rights will be issued to the person and to the team. That works the same way for any request over $5,000, except they go directly to the DDA first for review. And the DDA will have 20 business days to review the request. If they approve it, the FMCS is receive an email and you can and the team receive an email and you can go through the process of completing your modifications and making those payments. And if the DDA denies it, appeal rights will be issued to the person and to the team. Uh, the, that is um, our presentation. So now I'd like to turn it over to Nick Burton for any questions that we might have gotten. Yeah, nice job, Christy. Um, before we jump into questions really quickly, I just wanted to touch base on slide 15 about the uh, family being able to be the day-to-day -day administrator. You had said that we are working on a uh, waiver revision to address that issue so that family could be hired as a day-to-day -day administrator and are we currently actively working on that so that it is um, happening right. rather soon? That's right. That it would be our in our first amendment and it is happening very soon. All right. Perfect. Great. All right. So you have a lot of really good questions. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat so I can get to them. So I think the first question came up and then there were some other questions that were similar to it regarding the reasonable and customary rates. And it was specific to the day-to-day um, -day administrator, but I think in generally, are reasonable and customary rates soon going to be released? Very soon. There are some final adjustments that we need to make, but very soon, I hope to have it done by the end of the week. And it will include, those reasonable and customary rates will include day-to-day um, -day administrator for vendors and for employees. Awesome. All right, tell me this, Christy. Can the funds for recruitment and advertising be paid directly to the person and or their support broker? So the funds for recruitment and advertising and any other service in our waivers cannot be paid directly to the person who is self-directing, right? But if um, we're talking about reimbursement for uh, allowable recruitment and advertising fees, anyone else on the team may be reimbursed um, or the FMCS can pay for those things directly. By billing, that's how they get reimbursed by billing the FMCS? That's right, yep. So they would issue a reimbursement request <clears throat> with receipts. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so Christy, can a day-to-day -day administrator also provide another service? That is a great question. Yes, a day-to-day -day administrator may be an employee who is working another service like personal supports or community development. It's important to note that those services cannot happen at the same time. So an employee might work 20 hours in the morning every week, every day of the week um, of personal supports, and then they would do the day-to-day -day administration later in the day. Uh, but they'll need to make sure that there is no um, duplication of the work at the same time. Great. And Christy, what if that staff person that I, let's say I'm self-directing my service and I have a, a an employee that I have providing personal supports to me, but then I also want them to be my day-to-day -day administrator, but let's say they're already working 40 hours a week to be uh, providing personal supports to me. Um, mm -hmm. Does that affect their ability to be a day-to-day -day administrator? It does not. 
I will note that if, if that is how the team wants to work it out, it will cost a significant amount of money in order for that to happen. So remember that the day-to-day -day administrator is being paid out of cost savings. So it's funding that you have left over. Um, so if you plan on a time and a half, you will quickly um, use funds in a way that might not make sense for the team. So I would really caution against that, that you might wanna decrease uh, uh, employees hours so that they still work 40, which is, healthy and safe for all employees. We want people to be healthy and safe um, to make sure that they're working only 40 in the week. That would be ideal. Yeah, sounds like a good conversation for the team. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the day-to-day -day admin, <clears throat> is the outcome in the PCP tied to a service and then added to the service authorization in the PCP? That might be actually a question that I'll give to you, Nick. Okay, is the outcome tied to a service? So I think we've talked about how we want the PCP to be reflective of people's needs. Um, but in terms of the cost savings being utilized for the day-to-day -day admin position, that's really reflected on the uh, budget and the, uh, the budget sheet, correct? Christy? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think when we're looking at a person-centered plan, we want to make sure that the person-centered plan is reflective of the person's needs. And if the person has a need for the day-to-day -day admin, we would expect that the PCP would reflect that need. Exactly. Did you want to add anything, Christy? No, that's great. Thanks so much. So Christy, since virtual services are allowed, oh, I lost that one, hold on. So since virtual services are allowed, <clears throat> is someone allowed to hire someone who lives in another state, such as a friend who lives in New York or California? My FMCS isn't answering me. And if so, does virtual staff need to be CPR certified? I might add something okay. to this one if you don't yeah. mind, Christine. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yep. So, I think I think one thing important thing to note is that virtual services cannot be the entirety of a service. And so I think this is probably a team conversation and a conversation you want to have with the regional office. Um, I think if a personal, if somebody is providing supports to you virtually um, in another state um, and the services cannot be provided entirely virtually, that's probably a good conversation that the team needs to have. Um, and so I would I would say that probably the FMCS maybe isn't the first place I'd have that conversation. I'd have it with the region and with your team. Um, so that was a reasonable and customary rate question, which that's coming out. Mm -hmm. um, so, Christy, mm -hmm. are cost savings and unallocated funds different or are they the same? That's a great question. So the way I see it, is cost savings is a big umbrella term. It's a big, it, it covers both unallocated funds and other funds. So cost savings, in my, from my perspective, how we're defining it here means that it can be either funding that you've put in your budget already. So for instance, if you've uh, budgeted for um, health benefits for two of your employees and they've both declined those benefits, you have that extra funding that you've already put in the budget. From my perspective, that's what we would call cost savings, something that you plan for that you didn't need. Uh, so that's cost savings. Cost savings is also unallocated funds, which would be as, as a term that we've used to talk about the funding that never really gets allocated in the budget sheet. So you might have been approved for $250,000 of funding in your PCP, and then you might have budgeted 200,000 of that. So you would have $50,000 in unallocated funds. But from my perspective, both of those are considered cost savings. We're using it as a big term to talk about the funding that is left over after you've accounted for your needs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Christy, on slide 18, you talked about what the invoices for a day-to-day -day administrator vendor must include. Does that include 
um, a description of the work that they did. I'm sorry, I'm muted. Yep, that is exactly right. It is not included. Uh, vendors would not need or not required to include a description um, okay. in order for them to be paid. However, if a team, a person self-directing wants those details in the invoice, they should make that clear to their day-to-day -day administrative vendor and then they should require it or they should okay. include it because the person requires it. I hope that makes sense. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. So Chrissy, if I am self-directing my service and I want to go get my, uh, take my driver's education class, um, will individually directed goods and services be able to cover those fees? Driver's education fees. Um, I would reach out to your regional office um, on exactly, so I want to be careful um, about exactly what we're talking about. They might, but they might not. So reach out to your regional office and talk about the details of exactly what you want. And then we're, we're happy to help. Okay. So will there be a separate service code for day-to-day -day administrators at, uh, through the FMCS? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There definitely will be. So they are a budget line uh, and they will be separate. So when you are an employee who is working day-to-day -day administrating, uh, you would uh, log into your FMCS account and you would list that you're providing day-to-day -day administrator. Yes, it will be a separate code. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we got one, we got a scenario here that I'm going to read and then I, I have some initial thoughts and then Christy, I want to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we talked about how individually directed goods and services could be used to promote activities that promote health. And so there was a question that if a person has a goal to walk, can they purchase a ticket to a theme park to achieve this goal? Um, and then if yes, can this theme park be located out of state? And a couple of things that I would I would I would encourage the team to have a conversation about is one, um, you know, individually directed goods and services not is isn't for purely diversional activities or or um, uh, leisure activities such as oftentimes what a theme park would be considered. Um, also, are there other opportunities for the person to walk in their local community that would also meet that goal? in terms of walking. So I think it really is a team conversation about intent, the purpose, um, what the goal is, and what that really looks like for the person and how to best meet that goal um, that fits into DDA's standards, policies, procedures. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that, Christy? I would, I would say also, I think we, we have some clear exclusions and so tickets for purely recreational activities is listed under exclusions are not allowed. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's another question here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and answer, I think, uh, because it, it deals with, I think, case management um, and CCS, but I feel free to jump in, Christy. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, how is DDA going to monitor the day-to-day -day administrative service? 40 hours seems like a lot to allow for this service. Um, and I think a couple of things. One is that's a really good thing for the CCS to be monitoring as part of their monitoring responsibilities to ensure that a person's needs are being met and the PCP is being implemented the way that it should be. And so if there is a concern or if there's questions or if there's anything that the team needs to talk about in terms of what the person's need is, those, those conversations should happen. And I would hope that the uh, CCS is initiating those conversations and is the person if there are questions or needs that change related to the day-to-day -day administrator. Um, in terms of how DDA will monitor, we'll work closely with our CCS. Um, we'll work closely with individuals and families um, if issues pop up. We'll also be utilizing data on um, how many people are utilizing a day-to-day -day administrator um, just to make sure that that service is being implemented per our policies and procedures. Would you want to add anything to that, Christy? Oh, definitely, and we'll be using our FMCSs as great partners in that um, to be able to monitor. Um, right. So 
because it, it could be that sometimes a day-to-day -day administrator works 40 hours one week and then they work five hours the next week just depending on what is going on so we want people we want things to be flexible but we also want people to be um, in the driver's seat when it comes to making those choices about what they need perfect mm -hmm. so Chrissy if I'm gonna <clears throat> get internet mm -hmm. and I'm the person that's receiving services does my name need to be um, on the bill or on the internet account? Mm -hmm. It does not. It should be internet from the home in which the person lives. Um, and there will be reasonable and customary rates included in our reasonable and customary rates regarding internet services. So there will be some parameters. I'll also note that if the internet is in someone else's name, an important conversation that the person and their team should have would be perhaps uh, what portion of the internet bill is their responsibility. Um, I, I live with two roommates and our we have portions of all of our utilities that are our responsibility and so perhaps that is a discussion that should be made in the team um, uh, as they're planning out what uh, they might fund mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I mean there's a question here about um, remotely providing day-to-day -day administrator <laughs> services and I'm actually going to change uh, it a little bit and and focus more on can the day-to-day -day administrator services that are provided be provided directly and indirectly? Exactly. They definitely can. So a day-to-day -day administrator does not need, is not required to be with the person to provide the support. Now, kind of depending on what that person and the team decides, I think a great way to kind of clarify some things is to have a day-to-day -day administrator job description. So someone might require that their day-to-day -day administrator work directly with them all the time, but they may also say, well, I need you tonight to call my doctor and schedule an appointment. You don't need to be with the person to do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in terms of specialty clothing, it's like adaptive clothes or shoes. Is that something that could be covered under individually family directed goods and services? I would say that if there are some things that are maybe in our exclusions list that the team feels might um, might be an exception to that exclusion, please reach out to your regional office. Our regional offices and myself will work with you to try to figure out if um, if your request meets the definition of what you need. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then what about what about dentistry? What about the, the dental visits that people have traditionally used uh, individually, family directed goods and services for? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, dental services are included in an option to use. They're they're an op they're allowed. Um, so the requirements for dental services are specifically um, dental services that are not covered. Um, by health insurance. And we've also added that if a team has made a good faith effort to find services that are covered in uh, under their um, under their insurance and cannot find them, then individual and family directed goods and services could cover the costs. Mm -hmm. um, how about community college? What if I'm self-directing my services and I want to go to community college? Can individually family directed goods and services cover that? Good question. Um, again, I would say we would need to know the specifics, but from just reading this question and hearing this question, I would say that tuition is excluded, so it's not allowed. Um, but again, if you if you feel like there's exceptions to that rule, please reach out to your regional office, and and we'll all work with you to see if um, if we can if there are ways to be flexible. Mm -hmm. So, Christy, you showed us the handy dandy new tech forward form. Yeah. for requesting individually mm -hmm. family directed goods and services when does that form go into effect that is a great question that link is available now um, it will be only it can only be used for request on or after july 1st so if you are planning right now and you want to put in a request for something that would um, be purchased or rendered after july 1st you are absolutely able to go and um, to use that form. Uh, that link is available on the slide deck that is available today in our handouts, I think, um, but it'll also be available on our website later today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, 
let's see, let's say I have a person center plan and I've got a whole bunch of really cool services authorized in there to meet my need and there are waiver services. Um, do I also then have to fill out an individually directed family goods and services form to uh, for all of those services or is that separate? That's a great question. So it is not required that the uh, in the in the list of other. So uh, for day to day administrator and for recruitment and advertising, those will need to be included on the budget sheet, and the form will not be will not be is not it's not required, and you shouldn't be using the form for day to day administrator and recruitment and advertising. However, for any other request, uh, the form is required. It is not required that you include it on the budget sheet, but it will be required that you complete the form. Just um, for that, uh, the really reason behind this is that we're trying to really collect data on exactly what people are using their funding for, uh, so that we can share with other with people what kind of exciting and unique things are doing. So we want to. It is required that that form be completed for any good and service outside of recruitment and advertising and day-to-day -day administrator. But Christy, to clarify, if I author, authorize personal supports and adaptive technology in my plan, I don't need to then turn around and put those on the individually directed uh, oh, family no. goods and services form. Okay. No, because those, are, those would be, services. exactly, those are only for goods and services that are, are only for goods and services that aren't listed in the detailed service authorization. Great. <clears throat> Christy, somebody had a question about what sensory equipment would be. Um, and I was thinking back to when I was a case manager and I was working with uh, children and families and adults and families that had um, uh, access to individually family directed goods and services. And I remember that that was really individualized based upon a person's support needs, whether that be behavioral or medical. Sometimes it was people that had sensory balls. Sometimes it was mm -hmm. people that had um, art supplies that were sensory related. Sometimes it was um, uh, stuff that would, uh, earphones that would go on somebody's ears so that they could go do activities in the community and they weren't, uh, mm -hmm. the noise in the community didn't, didn't mm -hmm. harm their ears. So. Are there other examples that you've seen, um, particularly here in Maryland, that you wanted to highlight could be examples? Definitely. So in our policy and in our guidance, we have it listed as sensory items related to the person's disability and not covered by health insurance. And the uh, examples that we have listed are, I think, really great, such as headphones or weighted vests or weighted blankets. Those would be good examples of sensory equipment. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So on the uh, handy dandy uh, form that you created, can multiple services be requested or is it for one at a time? That is a really great question and I wish I had a better answer. But for now, the way our technology works and the way that the workflow works in order for it to be streamlined so that they get approved quickly, each request has to be completed one at a time. I'll kind of give you some examples to maybe ease some concerns. So for example, if you're requesting a gym membership, that would be one submission of the form. If you are requesting a year's worth of um, like horseback riding, that would be one form. You wouldn't need to re complete the request every month you need to pay for the service, but for each good or service, you would need to complete one form. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, Christy, um, in terms of the form, when in the person-centered planning process does the form happen? Um, does it happen before or after I use the service? Does it happen before mm -hmm. or after I want to go get the service? When do I submit the form if I'm in my annual planning process? The sooner, the better, um, but it definitely needs to be submitted and approved before the service is purchased. Uh, so you wanna make sure you're getting that request in quickly. Um, so you can complete it during your planning process. You could complete the form during a planning meeting. It takes a couple of minutes, 
um, or at any time after your plan is approved when you're ready to use the service. I think keep in mind that if you have some time sensitive things like a gym membership or you want to start using it immediately, the quicker you complete the form, the quicker it will get approved. But definitely before the service is rendered or paid out, you should definitely request it before that. So then there was a question about uh, the $5,000 limit, and it was yeah. kind of a tricky question. So it says, um, does DDA need to approve the form if it's exactly at 500? That's a now, good question. I, yeah, when I looked at slide 35, you say at 5,000 or above. Mm -hmm. So if it's $5,000 on the penny, does DDA need to review it? That's exactly right. So here's what I'm really, I'm really excited about this form because um, no one will be waiting on an email, right? Like there, there won't be someone, our regional office or FMCSs won't be required to send a manual email in order for a process to get started, which is really exciting to me. So when you fill out the form, the way this is built is that if you put $5,000 or higher, it will automatically go to the DDA regional office for review. So yes, exactly at 5,000. So $4,999.99, that goes to the FMCS directly. But if it's at $5,000 or more, it goes to the DDA. That's a good question. So Chrissy, <clears throat> on the off chance that a, let's say I submit something that's $5,000, Mm -hmm. And let's say for some reason it is not approved by the regional office. Mm -hmm. Am I going to receive appeal rights? Absolutely. You would definitely. So the way our process is built is that if the, if, if the regional office uh, denies a request, it automatically goes to myself and to the regional director. And all of us work together to make sure appeal rights are sent out uh, to the team and that the team is clear about why the request was denied. So, Christy, there's a question here. What happens if the DDA does not approve or deny within 20 days of the request? What should I what should we do as a team? What should I do as a person? That is a great question. I hope we have some systems in place that will allow that not to happen. So because we're receiving all of the data directly, I'm able to check that on a weekly basis to make sure we're not lapsing in those 20 days. However, if it does happen, please reach out directly to me and we will resolve that issue as soon as possible. Okay, let's yeah. see. Is there a cap on the total amount of individually family directed goods and services? That's a great question and we didn't review that today. We went over that in our um, waiver renewal um, presentation and I didn't say it today. There is not a cap. That is the biggest update to our waiver um, in the waiver renewal for goods and services is that there is no longer uh, a total amount. Uh, but keep in mind that goods and services are paid through cost savings and cost savings um, is funding that is available after the person's listed needs have been met. Mm -hmm. Let's see. <clears throat> Christy, what about a washer and dryer? Would that be included under individually family directed goods and services? Definitely. So in our guidance and in our policy and in our waiver, it says laundry appliances to promote independence and self-care if none exist in the home, such as washing machines and dryers. Okay. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do people access this form? Where is it at? That's great. It is a, there's a link. So it is housed in a, in a, um, in a software called Smartsheet. Um, and that link will be available today in our, um, in our slide deck that we've shared and will be on our website as well. Great. Um, let's talk about CPR training. Can a person be reimbursed for CPR training? So again, um, a person who is receiving services cannot be directly reimbursed 
for anything in their budget. However, any other member of the team may be reimbursed. Additionally, the FMCSs are equipped to purchase things directly for you. So a couple of examples of what that might look like for first aid and CPR, because I know this is, I think this is some tough stuff. So um, if you have an employee who is ready to start, but they need to complete first aid and CPR, or they need to re-up they need to uh, re -up their certification, they have a couple of options. They can, as a employee, purchase the, cert, uh, purchase the training and then put in for a reimbursement. Or another member of the team, such as um, a family member or support broker, may purchase the uh, training and then put in for reimbursement. Or the FMCS can directly pay for the training um, and facilitate that. So they, there are a couple of options, but it cannot be the person who is self-directing receiving reimbursement. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there's a lot of questions about day-to-day -day administrators being provided virtually, and I want yeah. to make sure that we're clear on a couple of sure. things. Virtually is a, is a way to provide a service. However, when we talk about the day-to-day -day administrator, we talk about the day-to-day -day administrator being direct or indirect, mm -hmm. and there can be some indirect services. Now, Christy, can the entirety of the day-to-day -day administrator be indirect, or do they also have to work with the person at times? It, it can be all completely indirect. I think I would, uh, if I were a member of someone's team, I would make sure that um, that day-to-day -day administrator has a job description where it is clear um, what that person is providing, when and how. Because if you're never working with the person directly, it might be difficult to know exactly what you're doing. Uh, so I would caution against entirely, uh, just because you wanna make sure that you're ensuring quality of your employees. So I would lean on a, a written job description, but yes, it could be entirely indirect. Okay. But let's remember, indirect is a little bit different than virtual. Virtually is a way to provide a service and we've outlined that in our waiver. But when we're talking about the day-to-day -day administrator, let's talk about it as direct indirect. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Christy, um, Let's say you have a staff member who is a, a DSP or an employee who's working 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. and then they also want to be the day-to-day -day administrator. Could they then go be a vendor and submit an invoice? And if they did that, would that still apply for the overtime? That is a great question. And yes, they could. So I have, there are a couple of, um, there are a couple of quick notes to note about that in our guidance that I will, which will be available online today um, that I'll highlight for you now. So in this scenario, um, an employee is working 40 hours and then they may wanna also become a vendor for day-to-day -day administrator. That is technically very okay. Keep in mind that if they're a vendor, they are no longer an employee. So overtime does not, does not count for any hours that they bill for as a vendor. They are responsible for those hours um, and they're responsible for the taxes um, that come out. So they would, they would not have taxes withheld if they completed an invoice. If an employee is providing a service as a vendor for a person, their invoice changes slightly. They are required in their invoice to include the times that they provide the service. So please note, Direct support employees who choose to also work as a person's day-to-day -day administrative vendor must include timestamps of the time they worked in their invoices. This is to ensure that the timesheets and their invoices, um, when you check them, you can check to make sure those times are not overlapping, that they're not providing the service at the same time. Thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. so <clears throat> We've got a scenario. So this person saying, we currently have two vendors providing classes under individually family directed goods and services. Do we continue to process their invoices as vendors each month like we currently do? What happens when we hit the $5,000 mark? So just, just to remind, the $5,000 mark is not a cap. The $5,000 mark 
is a, a note that the DDA has to review that service. So if you are receiving a class from a vendor for throughout the year, so if you're or a, a service or if you're doing something that is within the, um, I don't like the term class, but uh, so if you have um, uh, horseback riding or art, um, art classes or things like that, that you've already budgeted for the entire year. If you, if you submit a request for that and that request is over $5,000, the DDA needs to, needs to approve it. But once the DDA has approved it, you've got that funding for the year you've already requested it. Um, but, there, but there is no $5,000 cap on goods and services. It is just a, a mechanism to make sure the DDA is reviewing anything over that amount. So Christy, in this situation, since it's already been approved and is in the plan at the new plan renewal, if they want to continue to include those and it exceeds $5,000, they'd submit the IFD GS form. Well, I would say if they want to include it at all, they would need to submit the form. If it's under 5,000, it goes directly to the FMCS for processing. Um, but it, it, this is an annual every year for every plan. So um, if you if you were receiving art classes last year and want to continue this year, that form needs to be completed either way. But if it's already in a plan that's been approved right now, they don't need to worry about it till their annual plan year. Exactly. Their next annual plan. That, that's right. The next okay. annual plan. Mm -hmm. See here, Christy. Some of these repeat questions. So let's say I have a day-to-day -day administrator and with their hourly rate, it exceeds $5,000. Is the individually family-directed goods and services form applicable for the day-to-day -day so, administrator? That's a good question. For a day-to-day -day administrator, you would not complete the goods and services form. For the day-to-day -day administrator, you would need to include that in your self-directed budget sheet. So that would either be on the budget sheet during your annual plan or during a revised plan, but you would not request it on the form. Going through the questions, we have some that we just answered. Um, let's see. There are a lot of questions in terms of what will be covered or what won't be covered. And I think they're outlined in this presentation and outlined in the forthcoming guidance and policy are really clear about what can or can't be covered. Above and beyond that, that's a conversation that the team and regional offices need to have in terms of art supplies or in terms of activities. It really depends upon the situation, the person's circumstances, what it's needed, why it's needed for, can it be covered by a wavered service? Is those art supplies related to sensory? It really depends. It, it would be really difficult on this call for us to give a definitive answer, not knowing a team situation. And so I think it's really important that you use the guidance that's been given here as a guide and then start having conversations with the team, making sure the PCP is reflective of the need, and then making sure that if you have additional questions, you're talking to your regional office. All right, we've got one more question. Let's see. Trying to find one that's a new one. Um, let's see. Uh, um, in regards to the stamp time stamp that you mentioned, Christy, as it relates to um, employees who then maybe are going to be a vendor, is that described in any of our documents so that if a team needs to reference what that needs to look like, where would they look? It is in our guidance. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it'll be in our guidance that will be coming out rather soon, correct? Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, 
Christy, did you want to say anything to close us out here? I think we had some really great questions. We'll certainly um, take a look at those that we didn't get answered and do an FAQ and make sure we add that to our FAQ, but really wonderful questions, folks. Agreed, yes. And I think um, just be on the lookout on our website later today for um, our guidance and our, our policy has already been uh, open for public comment, um, but then our guidance will come out later today and be on the lookout for reasonable and customary rates and wages. Um, and also some cool resources, um, some quick guides regarding goods and services that I think might be helpful. All right. Thanks so much. Awesome. Dr. Smalls, anything to close us out? No, I think this was an awesome presentation. Great questions. And we will be uploading this, uh, the link to this recording into our newsletter if you, did, if you want to share it with other folks. And as Nick mentioned, it will be available on our YouTube channel as well. Again, thank you so much for your attendance and your thoughtful questions. I think we will definitely want to keep this train moving forward. Awesome, awesome job. Thank you so much.